Hello, um, I'm Cameron Scott, one of the story architects of Star Wars The High Republic, and you're listening to Genuine Chit Chat. Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 111. So my friends, this week I am tackling the five-part miniseries named Obi-Wan, written by Christopher Cantwell. This was meant to come out last week, in fact I recorded the whole episode last week, but my laptop died before I could back it up or edit it. So, let's try again. And if you haven't joined Star Wars Comics in Canon before, then welcome. I hope you have a good time. Basically what I do is I go through each of these comics in chronological order, and when I tackle each one, I talk about the vague plot details, sort of bullet points in a sense, going through it so you understand what's happening, and along the way I talk about various connections. I may give you information on certain planets or species that are involved, or characters that pop up again, or events that are referenced, those sorts of things. So each of these episodes can serve as a refresher if you've already read the comics, or if you've never touched these comics or any Star Wars comics before it serves as a great way to understand the canon in a wider way while along the way also finding out some additional information so with that all in mind let's get moving so before i delve into the first comic just a few bits and pieces of information about obi-wan so he was born 57 years before the battle of yavin on the planet stujon uh, that means he was obviously 57 years old when he died on the death star only maybe hours before the battle of yavin And there are some other episodes of Star Wars Comics and Canon you should check out if you are interested in this one. So episode 11, I tackle the Obi-Wan and Anakin comics. It's a mini-series written by Charles Soule. They're pretty good. Uh, Then also in episode 31, I did the Age of Republic one-shots, including Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan's own individual comics. So they're really good if you want to hear more about those two. And then in episode 32, I did the Journals of Old Ben Kenobi. These are three comics which were in the 2015 Star Wars run by Jason Aaron, but they are basically Luke reading Obi-Wan's journals journals that he was writing while he was on Tatooine and so you get three stories of Obi-Wan on Tatooine that all somewhat interconnect and in that story you get to see his interaction with Black Chrysanthemum who is the Wookiee bounty hunter that we saw in the Book of Boba Fett but a lot of comic readers would recognize him from the 2015 Darth Vader comics and then the sort of spiritual successor of those the 2016 Dr. Afra comics so make sure you check those out as well. Now these comics that I'm tackling this week, these five by Christopher Cantwell, they take place in zero years before the Battle of Yavin, so it's alluded to only being days or potentially weeks before the events of A New Hope, but then there are various flashbacks throughout. When I tackle each of the flashbacks, I will then give information on where they are in the timeline and that sort of thing. But without further ado, let's delve into things. So issue number one was released May 4th, 2022, that's Star Wars Day. Issue five was released September 14th, 2022, and the trade paperback collection is due to be released december 13th 2022 and the trade paperback collection and this story arc is called a jedi's purpose and as i said christopher cantwell is the writer of all of these issues but there's a variety of artists and color artists who take the helm per issue and so i'll just list those as we delve into each issue so let's go into issue number one then the artist for it is ario anandito and the color artist is carlos lopez and before i delve into the story here is the crawl The ultimate destiny of one of the Jedi's most renowned masters fast approaches. As he awaits an inevitable storm in the remote deserts of Tatooine, Obi-Wan Kenobi takes time to reflect on and record key moments of a heroic life long lived. So issue one starts with Obi-Wan narrating. Now one of the best things about these five issues is being able to hear Obi-Wan narrate every part of this entire miniseries. So when you get the flashbacks to certain parts of his life, it's really interesting hearing his thoughts to add a bit of context of how he was feeling at the time and how he feels like it sort of changed him. Now, I'm not going to read out his narrations. There's one part, I think, near the end that I'll uh, read out a bit. But generally speaking, I'm not going to be reading out his narrations. If you want to get that degree of content, pick up the comics. I think some of them are on Marvel Unlimited at the moment. I know the fifth issue has only been out for a short period of time. So I would say just pick it up or wait till December and pick up the trade paperback collection. It doesn't mean you can't listen to this episode, but I would hugely, hugely recommend it as I do on every episode of the show. Pick up the comics, support the creators in any way you can, either via reading on Marvel Unlimited limited or go to a library and requesting them or actually physically buying them i always recommend people do that but 
back into the story. So Obi-Wan is narrating and he notes that it's only rained on Tatooine once since he's been there over the last 19 years and that was about four days after he arrived and it just hasn't rained since. Now a bit of information about Tatooine. So Obviously, it has two suns, but it also has three moons. The days usually last 34 hours, and there's approximately 304 days in a year. Now, they used to have oceans and rainforests. That has been mentioned. I know in the Book of Boba Fett it was, and I think across canon it's been kind of alluded to, but we've not actually seen it in canon in this luscious landscape that we've been told it used to have. Hopefully, as the High Republic goes further back, or even the Old Republic, we'll get a bit more information on that, but for now, we just don't know. And the approximate population on Tatooine is around 200,000, which is not very much at all. But moving on. So as Obi-Wan is writing in his journal, he notes that a sandstorm approaches. He feels things, there's a pressure drop, there's subtle signs everywhere, including his Aopi who sits facing his wall of his hut with his eyes closed. Now his Aopi is named Akani. You actually get to see Akani in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, you know, on Disney Plus and things. And Aopis, you actually saw them first in The Phantom Menace. There's that uh, infamous scene where... Anakin is preparing for going on the pod racing track at the Bunda Eve pod race and then a camel-ish looking creature farts and then Jar Jar says like PU and stuff and it's just it's pretty awful one of my least favorite parts of all of Star Wars I will say I'm not a fan of that kind of humor but regardless of that that's what an IOP is it's basically like a camel-ish sort of thing but they have like long like snouts almost like a mini elephant snout kind of like a pygmy elephant snout almost or tapir maybe but yeah they're basically like camel-esque things uh, you can find them obviously on Tatooine but you can also find them on Seleucami and Batu as well so back to the story Obi-Wan is feeling this change around him of the storm, but he also feels a certain surge in darkness. So he decides to take note of the storm, and then he recalls a time in his life where he's felt something similar to the surge of darkness that was mentioned before. So that means we go back by 49 years, so that's 49 years before the Battle of Yavin, when Obi-Wan was approximately 8 years old. So I believe in canon this is the furthest back we've gone in Obi-Wan's timeline. This is when he was a youngling, so it's before he gets chosen by a Jedi, to be their Padawan learner, obviously before he gets chosen by Qui-Gon. So let's delve into the flashback. Obi-Wan wakes up in the temple and then looks around the room and can't find his friend Garen. It's night time and the gathering is going to be soon, so he decides to go out and try and find her. Now the gathering you actually get to see in the Clone Wars series. So season 5 episode 6 is one of the highlights I think of the Clone Wars. It's something we don't really get to see in Star Wars that often. And it's a group of Padawans escorted by Ahsoka Tano as well as Yoda to go and find their first kyber crystals so they can build a lightsaber. It's a really really interesting arc. It really delves deep into some of the more spiritual side of the force. But also you get introduced to quite a few cool Padawans who... Uh, the assumption is most of them do not survive Order 66 or probably Anakin literally cutting them down within like a year or two later. But putting that little darkness aside, it's a really, really cool arc and you get to see how a Jedi first finds their kyber crystals, especially in the pre-Order 66 era when Ilum hadn't been mindful of its resources and things because obviously they used a lot of what made Ilum the kyber crystals. They used a lot of that when making the Death Stars and also then Ilum became Starkiller Base in the sequel trilogy. But yeah, really recommend if people haven't checked out the Clone Wars, obviously check that out, especially that arc. You don't really need to have seen any other episodes of Clone Wars, so if you want to just dip your toes in, you can check that out. But back to the story. Obi-Wan manages to find Garen and she is sat on the roof of the Jedi Temple. She sees visions of her dad in pain, so wants to try and help him, wants to get off world and then go and stop his death. Obi-Wan tries to convince her out of this, but she's having none of it, and then says, look, I'm going down to Coruscant and you can't stop me. So she then leaps down into Coruscant below. Obi-Wan is just kind of there trying to figure out what to do and then decides to follow. So Obi-Wan then dives off the top of the Jedi Temple as well. Obi-Wan notes that Garen was Obi-Wan's best friend and he believed actually her only friend until she convinced him otherwise saying look everyone else likes you you're just a bit shy and things even if we're close there are other people who still like you and Garen was also always looked out for Obi-Wan so there is a degree of emotional connection there potentially more than just friendship. 
So Obi-Wan searches around Coruscant for hours. Obviously, he has no weapons or anything. He's just basically a kid in Jedi robes. And then he gets cornered by some thugs. There is a masked human, I believe, as well as a Rodian, an Aqualish, and a Trandoshan. So Rodian, Greedo is the most famous Rodian you'd know. You know, green-skinned, big eyes, sort of antenna on their head. Aqualish, you'd have seen that also in A New Hope. That was Ponda Baba, is probably the most famous Aqualish. He was the person who Obi-Wan actually sliced the arm off when there was that little bit of conflict between Ponda Baba and Dr. Cornelius Everson when he's going, you know, he doesn't like you, that sort of thing. And Luke's like, um, I don't really know how to deal with this. The person whose arm gets sliced off, that is Ponda Baba, who is an Aqualish. And then the famous Trandoshans would be Bosk as well as Skier from the High Republic. They are basically lizard people. So Obi-Wan fights them, he uses the force on them, he manages to use the mind trick on one of them as well, and does seem to put up a fight, but then is kicked down. And then before the thugs can kind of wail on him while he's down, Garen saves him. And it shows that Garen is actually there with the leader of this group, who is a Zabrak. Now the Zabrak works for Black Sun, and is actually a lieutenant within it, so quite high up. Now Black Sun, they are a crime syndicate that I believe first appeared in the Shadows of the Empire, which is part of Legends. Uh, but in canon, they're in the Clone Wars. Prince Zizor from Legends is is one of the heads of it in a sense but then the council who kind of run black sun they are all farleen uh, which are green-skinned humanoid beings so black sun they do appear quite a lot they're in the war of the bounty hunters as i said they're in the clone wars and things especially when maul gets involved and starts sort of rallying the crime syndicates together but yeah quite a popular one along with the pikes pikes and black sun are kind of similar ish in size but it's confirmed that garen actually paid the zaprak leader with a family heirloom of hers just to try and get her off world so they then get escorted to the ship where Garen is meant to be leaving, and they are then handcuffed. They then talk for a short period of time, and then Garen and Obi-Wan decide to escape. So they break their handcuffs, and then do a very big Jedi jump out of the roof, and then manage to escape. When they're out of the area a little bit, Garen tells Obi-Wan that she doesn't want to return to the temple. Obi-Wan tries to convince her otherwise, but she's having none of it, she needs to go and find her father. So, they basically bid each other farewell, and Obi-Wan returns to the Jedi temple. He gets there, and who is there waiting for him? It's wise old Yoda. Yoda seems to know exactly what's happened, and speaks to Obi-Wan a little bit about this, and he basically says it's not really Obi-Wan's fault, you can't blame yourself for this, but you tried. Yoda then gives Obi-Wan a mop, and then tells him to think about all of these things that have happened, you know, think it over and make peace with it. And Obi-Wan notes to himself that he never saw Garen Rand ever again, and he hopes that she didn't succumb to the fears, which is exactly as he's trying to do today, trying to not succumb to the fear of what's to come. I couldn't see that Garen Rand appeared elsewhere, so uh, let's move on to issue number two. So issue two has the artist Luke Ross and the colour artist Nolan Woodard. So let's delve back into the story. In air quotes present day with Obi-Wan on Tatooine, the sandstorm draws nearer and nearer, and then he thinks of darkness and his duel with Maul, which you actually get to see in Star Wars Rebels. And before that, he used to believe that the light could always shine through, but that confrontation really shook him. Now, I'm not going to spoil what happens in that confrontation, but I will recommend that everyone checks out Star Wars Rebels. Anytime I can talk about it, I will bring it up. It is the best piece of Star Wars content, in my opinion, including any of the live stuff we've had at the moment, and or is shaping up to be incredible. However, for me, Rebels is the best Star Wars content outside of probably the original trilogy. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's got some of the best Star Wars moments there are in it. You don't have to have seen The Clone Wars. You don't have to have seen any other piece of Star Wars content. You don't even have to have seen the original trilogy, but I'm highly doubtful for you're listening to this and haven't seen that but i would just say give rebels a go i know certain people try and avoid animation for some reason but give it a go series one is good it's a good series it's not amazing but it is good the finale is very good but then series two onwards it's just absolutely incredible the finale of series two of rebels is probably my favorite piece of star wars content that exists aside from the mustafar obi-wan and anakin confrontation in revenge of the sith it is that good and obviously you get maul in rebels as well and maul from clone wars and rebels is just incredible so go watch star wars rebels if you haven't already so after that sort of thought and whatnot, Obi-Wan then has another flashback. So it seems like it would be between 44 years before the Battle of Yavin and 32 years before the Battle of Yavin. So that's around a 12 year gap. It's probably nearer the Phantom Menace, judging by how Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are drawn in this and how you kind of see them. I think it's meant to insinuate it's quite close to the Phantom Menace, but we don't actually know for certainty. So it could be essentially at anywhere of a decade before that point. 
And what's happened is that Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan have been sent to a mining incident that's happened in the Kadea system. So the two of them wear modified macro binoculars to try and see in the rain outside, and then they head into this facility and things are still peculiar. They're, they're very dark and things feel off, so they keep their macro binoculars handy. So they ignite their lightsabers, but then the lightsabers start to seem like they're dim or dimming. It's quite bizarre, and they get to this control panel and find this guy bleeding out on the floor, who as they get to him, he says like two words and then he dies. They also note there's a bunch of diamonds in a bag which are on this facility control panel, this computer panel. They're a little bit confused by that, but Qui-Gon notes that this planet has such unusual weather, it seems to foster the natural creation of diamonds. So it has a larger than expected diamond reserve, and therefore that's probably what that guy was there trying to get. They check the scanners and equipment in this facility, and then note there are some strange radiation readings, and then they hear this very loud roar. So they decide to head to this roar, and then are knocked down by something that is seemingly invisible. They then hear out a cry for help. So Qui-Gon says, look, I'll go help out whoever's calling out. You try and find this creature, Obi-Wan. So Obi-Wan follows this invisible creature. He follows them more and more, and they get to essential complete darkness. So Obi-Wan reactivates his macro binoculars, and it uses infrared to be able to see what this thing was. And it seems to be a beast. It looks a little bit like a werewolf, so that's what you're kind of getting at. But its eyes are bright red, and it's drooling a lot, and it's got bloodstains all over it as well. So Obi-Wan starts to try and swing at it with his lightsaber, but can't get hit on it. He gets scratched in the face, and then decides to focus himself using the force, and then manages to kick this beast in the head. Qui-Gon then enters and he's got a chap with him who basically is a thief. A group of them knocked out the power core in this facility to try and steal lots of diamonds. However, the vast majority of them have already been killed. So what's noted is that the power core seems to be causing this darkness from a peculiar type of radiation. It needs to be sorted or the moon could be in darkness for eons. It would essentially kill the moon and prevent any life from being able to survive on there. So it's quite an important thing they need to do. So they head on their way because the werewolf thing kind of ran away after it got kicked in the face by Obi-Wan and when Qui-Gon appeared. And the group come across a Gran species. So the Gran is like a humanoid person who has the head of kind of like a goat, but with three eyes on eye stalks and also antenna. There are several Gran species. You see a lot of them in the prequels. There's even a famous senator or two that are Gran as well. So in the Clone War series, as well as the prequels, you can see the Gran species quite a lot. So this Gran is a minor supervisor, and he says that the minor, Rosak, is a Defel species, and it seems that the radiation poisoning may be affecting him and driving him mad, and he seems to be the one who's attacking everyone. So a Defel is a wolf-like being that can bend light around themselves to become near invisible. You saw them briefly in A New Hope, and they're also in the Afro comics as well, in brief, but I've never really delved into them, because in the canon, they're not really mentioned that much. This seems to be the most they've actually been in a story in the most amount of spotlight that's been on them but they are in star wars legends quite a bit in a lot of different places so that's kind of where they started they're quite a lot like shistavarans uh, which are the other wolf people in star wars except the devil seems to be a bit more of a werewolf as opposed to shistavaran seems to be more like a teen wolf sort of thing it's kind of just like a human wearing fur compared to someone who's like a, this big hulking mass that's kind of the difference between a devil and a shistavaran as far as i can see but also with the devil a devil has that ability to bend light around them which gives them an extra edge so Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, the thief and the minor supervisor are then all talking where to go from here and the Defil then attacks once again. It seems to kill that thief that was with Qui-Gon, so all that's left is the Gran, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon tells Obi-Wan to go and solve this riddle, figure out what's happened here, why this is all happening, all this darkness and whatnot, and Obi-Wan kind of gathers and believes it's probably the core, so he decides to go down and fix the core. The Grand goes with him because the Grand guides Obi-Wan because they're now in almost complete darkness, they basically can't see anything, but the Grand can guide him because he just remembers the facility quite well. So they get to the place where the core is in there, and the core has just been shattered into lots of pieces. So Obi-Wan uses the Force to connect these pieces back together into this cylindrical tube, like a big rod, and then slots it into the core as the Gran is operating at the computer system control panel. And as it goes in, Obi-Wan braces himself with the Force. However, he did not expect the blinding light that came out from the core being reconnected. He then wakes up in a medical bay, specifically in a bed in basically a hospital. There's a medical droid there as well as Qui-Gon, the Defil, and the Gran. The Defil apologises to everyone for all the havoc that he caused, but they say that it's not your fault. Because of how light sensitive your species is, when all of this sort of stuff started happening, you couldn't really control yourself. He is still feeling very regretful and feels remorse over it, but it is then noted at least he only killed the thieves that went in there, no one else was seemingly hurt. 
Qui-Gon then congratulates Obi-Wan on his good work, and although he's currently in bed completely blind with a bandage around his eyes, his vision will steadily return. They all thank each other, and then the comic ends. So with that in mind, let's move on to issue number three. And this has got the artist Alessandro Miracolo and the colour artist Frank William. And so it goes back to present day on Tatooine. Obi-Wan thinks of Owen, Beru and Luke as the sandstorm draws nearer and nearer. He then thinks about the Clone Wars and specifically of a Jedi's purpose in the war. He thinks that there are so many elements of what good he did, but then he kind of realises that all of it was just a folly anyway because Palpatine was manipulating both sides, so anything that they felt like was a win didn't actually really seem to achieve anything. And Obi-Wan thinks that he was both strengthened by the Clone Wars, but also forever wounded by it. And he reflects on the wars as a whole, thinking about Geonosis, Christophsis, and more. So just a few things to note before delving into the flashback. Some of the planets I mentioned, so obviously the Battle of Geonosis, that's what started off the Clone Wars, that was in the end of Attack of the Clones. Then we've got Christophysis, so that was first in the Clone Wars movie, which starts, you know, before the Clone Wars series, apart from like two episodes, so that's where that's from. Then Dantooine is obviously mentioned in A New Hope, and it's not seen in the Clone Wars, I don't think, but it is mentioned in Lost Stars, which is Claudia Gray's young adult novel. I believe it's her first Star Wars novel, and it is absolutely incredible. It's still, to this day, one of the best Star Wars novels inside or outside of canon. I hugely recommend it to anyone who's looking to get into some Star Wars literature. It's incredible. Then there's Hypori. It's, this is probably the most interesting one. So Hypori is mentioned in the comic. It's in Rogue One Catalyst by James Lucino, but it's actually in Legends a fair amount, but primarily in the Clone Wars micro series. So you can get it on the vintage Star Wars part of Disney+. Plus. A lot of us remember it from the Cartoon Network days. It was before Revenge of the Sith came out and before the Clone Wars animated 3D series came out. And it was made by the gentleman who made the Samurai Jack cartoons. And the Clone Wars micro series, a lot of the episodes were just like two or three minutes long with little to no dialogue. And they are legends now. But a lot of the things in there could be considered canon, although there is quite a lot of stuff in there that does completely contradict stuff in the Clone Wars. So, meh. But the reason I'm mentioning it and why it's so interesting is because Hypori is mentioned in this comic as the place where Grievous first attacked and he slaughtered loads of Jedi. Well, chapters 20 and 21 of the Clone Wars micro series specifically show that. You've got General Grievous. He fights Shark T as well as Kiadi Mundi, who are the two Jedi that survive. I think uh, Shark T gets wounded. But then he kills loads of other characters, including including a fan favourite, Shah Gi. Now, Shah Gi was based on Shaggy from the Scooby-Doo, well, franchise, I guess. I mean, everyone knows what Scooby-Doo is and who Shaggy is. So Shah Gi is basically him if he was a Jedi. And you watch him get slaughtered by Grievous. It's pretty intense. But yeah, Grievous just kills loads and loads of Jedi in this micro series. So obviously this referencing that says that generally speaking, the stuff that we saw in the Clone Wars micro series is in theory canon. It's just not specific on if Shagi was canon, if Kiri Mundi was there, Shakti, etc. It's just that from what we can assume at the moment, unless any other content comes out that says otherwise, that chapters 20 and 21 of the Clone Wars micro series could be considered canon. So I just thought that was a really interesting deep cut because I recognise the the system Hypori, but I looked into it a little bit more. I was like, oh my god, it's that one. So I just thought that was really cool. But with that all in mind, let's delve into the actual comic that yourselves are here for. So after Grievous attacked, it then caused a lot of worry in the Republic and the Jedi Order as a whole. So in a briefing room, there's several people all sort of talking and whatnot, but Obi-Wan and Commander Cody are there. And they're told about this mega ion cannon that's capable of disabling an entire fleet in one blast. So Obi-Wan volunteers the 212th Battalion and they go to prepare for the mission. And I think that Anakin is the 501st Legion, which is quite interesting. But moving on, before they go off to this battle and the adventure, in a sense, Obi-Wan is introduced to two non-clone soldiers who want to be involved. So this is Oron and Mechadrix. They're just two humans and they just want to be involved, so they join the battalion. So Obi-Wan then meditates for the night before, and then he kind of opens his eyes, and they're basically there, heading to Abrion Major. Now, the only way into the facility is via a supply bridge. They've got fortified defences on water, they've also got anti-aircrafts and things like that, so it's just this one supply bridge. So they go on there, and there's a lot of action scenes in this comic, so I recommend picking up and reading it, but they take heavy losses, but they do manage to push on. Now, in the middle of this whole battle with clones dying all around Obi-Wan, he looks at the sunrise and he stares at it for a few seconds, realising how much he just doesn't want to be where he is right now. And then Cody dives out and tackles him to the ground, saving him from being blown up by a blast from some sort of vehicle nearby. 
Obi-Wan then has the epiphany. He realizes that his role, the Jedi's purpose in these wars, must be to protect life. So then everything became a lot more clear. He got his clone troopers to push on and he focused all his energy on trying to protect them, which made things a bit easier. Through pressing on and whatnot, Obi-Wan could feel the death all around him as tremors in the force, but eventually they do get into the facility and they do get the plans. They then come to the other squadron, but the other squadron is not responding to them, so it seems to be just them, and there's only a handful of them in this facility. They head outside, and then some IG units and Hellfire droids all attack, which Obi-Wan thinks to himself this proves this base is backed by the banking clan, and it was maybe a trap. So IG units, you know IG-11, IG-88, IG-88 seen in Empire Strikes Back, IG-11's in The Mandalorian, uh, so skinny droids that often become bounty hunters and things. And then Hailfire droids. I remember them mainly from the PlayStation 2 Battlefront 2 game, but they're basically a two squares of missiles with giant wheels next to them. That, that's basically all they are. You see them in Attack of the Clones. It is just two rings with missiles in the middle. That's all they are. You can ride them as vehicles in Battlefront 2 on the PS2. Um, but yes, that's a Hellfire droid. But anyway, as Obi-Wan and co. leave the facility, their ships are destroyed as are their LAATS, or LATS. So they're apparently ships on the water, which have been destroyed by all the weapons at this facility. And then the LATS, the low-altitude assault transports, they've all been destroyed as well. Now, they are Republic gunships. You see them in Attack of the Clones. It's the famous scene where they're in the Geonosian arena, and then the clones all come in with Yoda swooping down in a vehicle. That's a LAT, or LAAT. So Obi-Wan then decides on the supply bridge to try and clear a path. So he swings his lightsaber in big arcs, he uses the force with a big push and things, and he manages to get a few of the clones off the bridge. The Republic then want to bomb the bridge, but Obi-Wan says, well, you can't, there's wounded on there. But the bombers have already been sent out, so there's not really anything they can do. So Obi-Wan is then left with only a few of the clones he went with, and the one non-clone who is Mechadrix, because Oron was killed. And the final panels of this depressing comic is Obi-Wan sat there just staring at the sunset. He needs to know that the light can prevail. And Cody approaches him and mentions that the evacuation is arriving. And then the comic just ends. So it's a pretty depressing one. And it's really showing that a lot of the battles in the Clone Wars were just horrendous to be involved with. As are pretty much all wars, I'd say. But moving on. Issue number four. So the artist for it is Madabek Musabekov, and the colour artist is Sebastian Cheng. So on Tatooine, the storm has come. Obi-Wan notes that the planet is slightly cooler, but it is still absolutely sweltering, and his moisture evaporator breaks yet again. Everything is just ageing, including Obi-Wan, which he notes himself, and he notes that the pendulum swings and the darkness returns. And then we get a flashback. So this is yet another Clone Wars era flashback. This is around 20 years before the Battle of Yavin and it is before Maul resurfaces, which is around the end of series three of the Clone Wars, just for context. So Obi-Wan notes that the war is taking its toll on both Obi-Wan and Anakin at the time, but their rapport is stronger than ever. They're called from the front lines of a battle to this secret mission. They're not told anything about it, literally at all, which is very rare, and they speak with Yularen. Now, Yularen is interesting because he was basically a background character in A New Hope, and then Lucas liked him so much he put him in the Clone Wars, and then from there he's kind of had a life of his own, as it were. So in the Clone Wars, he is voiced by Tom Kane, and Tom Kane also narrates the Clone Wars for the start and things, saying, you know, previously on, etc. But Yularen, his first name is Wolf, and he starts as like, I think it's commander in the Army of the Republic, and then when the Republic becomes the Empire, it then sort of changes, but he stays loyal to the Republic slash Empire. So he also is quite close to Palpatine. I think in the Clone Wars he is somewhat, but then when the Empire comes in, he becomes a lot closer to Palpatine. And he's in the Clone Wars, he's also in the Thrawn book, and he's also in one episode of Rebels. And a very, very minor spoiler, he does actually appear in a recent episode of Andor, funnily enough. And I only know that because the subtitles name him Yularen, so that was quite a fun little thing. And that was the episode that just got released this week, so fun times. But moving on, so Yularen speaks with Obi-Wan and Anakin about this secret mission. Basically, they believe that Mechadrix, the guy from the prior comic, has gone rogue. He was involved in a couple of battles that he won, but there was a big loss at Deveron. Now, Deveron is actually in the Clone Wars episode Monster, which is where Savage Opress kills just a couple of Jedi and loads of clones and things. It's a very brutal episode that is the first episode I watched, and I was like, I can't believe this is basically a kid's show. It is amazing. It's Series 3, Episode 13, and anything with Savage Opress or Maul is some of my favourite stuff, but that episode Monster is especially powerful. 
So that's what we understand him to be referring to. And after that Devaron slaughter, Mechadrix then disappeared after that heavy loss. And it's confirmed that some clones, as well as some members of the Separatist Council, have actually been killed by a group called Deathwind. And they believe that Deathwind is basically Mechadrix. They think that his mind must have been broken from all the trauma experienced from going through all these wars. So the Republic want Obi-Wan and Anakin to try and assassinate him. Anakin is absolutely furious of this and wants to just bring him in alive because he says we're not separatists, we don't assassinate people like that, he deserves a fair trial, you know, all that sort of stuff. And after that, they then head to the planet Ando. So this is Ando's first appearance in canon, but it seems to be in Legends a fair amount. And in Legends, it was the Aqualish homeworld. So it's kind of watery and boggy and things. And in canon, it's still quite swampy and stuff. So see, Anakin is still complaining about how the Republic wants him to assassinate people. And Obi-Wan is saying, I understand, we don't have to do it in that way. I don't really agree with it either. You know, we can take him in and do it the right way. So they go forward and they go through this bog and they spot some clone armor. And it seems to be put there as warnings. Obi-Wan then mentions that he wished that he didn't have to kill and wishes that Anakin didn't have to kill either. And that's inside of his sort of inner narration, because obviously once a Jedi has to kill someone, it does change them, just like anyone has to kill someone in real life, it changes them too. But they get closer and closer and they approach this temple, and then two guards emerge from the water on either side of them and ask for their weapons, specifically their lightsabers. So they agree and they enter, walking up these stone steps, and Obi-Wan notes that the temple must be of Sith origin because he sees some Sith writing on it. And then he thinks there's likely some sort of dark side influence here, so it might be even harder to convince Mechadrix to come without a fight. So then there's a big conversation with Mechadrix. Now this does go on for a little while. Once again, if you want the full details of it, read the comic. But Mechadrix basically claims to serve death. He believes that all life and everything leads to annihilation. And then this is the part I found the most harrowing. And when I turned the page and saw this, it really struck me. So he has a weapon and it is a blade. But the blade is made from a spine, specifically a clone spine. So the armor that we saw earlier on that I mentioned, what he did is he killed some clone troopers, put their armor out there as a warning, and then pulled out the spine of one of them, cleaned it off, and then sharpened it into a weapon. And from what it looks like, he does use it. So it's got a pointy end, and then the hilt where he's holding it, it consists of the protruding parts of the fragments of one's spine. It is very intense, and it's a lot to think about, but it's in this comic, and I'm so glad that it is. But Mechadrix then continues on and says that death rules everything. Nothing has any meaning. So Obi-Wan says, well, if death does truly rule all, then what use does death have for people having names or people having friends or even something like a sunrise? What is that? Why would death want that if he controls everything? Mechadrix can't answer. And so Obi-Wan basically asks him again. And Mechadrix then just stares at Obi-Wan. And then the next panel is him lunging at him with the spine blade lifted high. But then Anakin is right in his way, holding his arm that's got the blade on it, and Anakin's lightsaber has been ignited straight into the middle of Mechadrix. Anakin immediately says that he's sorry about this and he didn't mean to. And Obi-Wan says, look, Anakin, you didn't do anything wrong. It's fine. And then Mechadrix is slowly lowered onto the floor, and he says that it was the quickest way back to the sunrise. And Obi-Wan says he is home. Anakin is looking sad about this because obviously Anakin never actually wanted to kill Mechadrix. He just wanted to take him in, but it was an immediate knee-jerk reaction and he potentially saved Obi-Wan's life. I imagine Obi-Wan would have probably seen it coming and been able to do something, but still, he did do that. And then the final words in this comic is Obi-Wan's narration saying, The light will shine again once the storm passes, but for how long? And so with that, we move on to this final comic, issue number five. So issue five has got the penciler, Adriana Mello. It's got the inker, Wayne Foucher, and then it has the colour artist, Dono Sanchez Almara. It's set in present day, as in on Tatooine and things, before New Hope, and there are no flashbacks. So the storm has passed, and there have been four ration containers stolen from a nearby Imperial facility. So an Imperial officer tells the commander of a squad, who is called JM909, to go and kill the Tuscan Raiders, who they believe are responsible for this, because the amount of damage around the rations and things seems to be Tuscan weapons that caused it. JM, let's call him Jim, Jim believes that it may invite some retaliation from the Tuscans, and then the officer immediately starts yelling at him and telling him to listen to him, and then threatens him with hard labour. So Jim then quickly obeys. While this is going on, Obi-Wan goes across the desert at night time. He mentions it is cooler, and he is riding his AOP Akani. 
He has his saber close to him, and then it cuts to show there is a squad of 15 stormtroopers, including Jim, heading towards the Tuscan Raider camp, and three of them are on Jubax. So Jubax, you see them only on Tatooine, it seems. They're about two meters long, and you saw them in A New Hope. They are non-sentient, and they are reptilian. Uh, they're in The New Hope, and then if you watch The New Hope Special Edition, which is more or less the only version you can actually get nowadays, that you see quite a lot of stormtroopers riding these Jubaks. A little bit jarring, uh, but yeah, that's what a Jubak is. So the stormtroopers then spot the camp and the containers. So they then decide to form up. Some of them go left, go right, go through the middle, you know, that sort of thing. When they are then in position, they then shoot the Massives. So Massives are essentially the dogs of Tusken Raiders. Although they are actually reptiles, uh, you see them in Attack of the Clones. I'm pretty certain that Anakin kills a couple. Um, they're about one meter long. They're from Tatooine, but you can also find them on Florum and a few other places. You see them in the Clone Wars, uh, and you obviously see them on Tatooine. But yeah, you've seen them before in the prequels or Clone Wars. So the stormtroopers kill a couple of those and then get closer. They then start to shoot what they think is Tusken Raiders, but they turn out to be decoys. They notice it's a trap and then suddenly they are just gunned down by loads of Tusken Raiders that are at higher ground. And there's a couple that aren't shot that get KO'd by a gaffy stick. It's also known as a Gaddafi stick, but it's basically the stick. Boba Fett made one in Book of Boba Fett. It's the Tusken Raider weapon. So Obi-Wan is sort of nearby and here's what's kind of going on. So he kind of goes near it to a degree and then waits for the Tuscans to sort of leave. He then sees that the Tuscans are leaving with some new gear, specifically some E-11 medium blaster rifles, which is the standard blaster rifles that stormtroopers have. So obviously he knows who won. He decides that, as obviously the Tuscans won, he can go and scavenge. So he goes, he takes a couple of power cells from one of the corpses that are there, and nearby, the stormtrooper Jim has got a pretty nasty head wound and chest wound, but he is alive. So Obi-Wan decides to carry him back on Akani, his AOP, and takes off his helmet. While this is happening, Obi-Wan is still thinking about a Jedi's purpose is still to protect life, is to preserve it in things. You're kind of echoing some of the themes throughout these comics. And when they get sort of partway back to Obi-Wan's hut, when they then get sort of partway to Obi-Wan's hut, Jim then slides off the OP, falls to the ground, and then tries to run away. But he's so wounded, he basically just kind of collapses only a few feet away. Obi-Wan goes to help him and says, look, you are incredibly hurt and you're not going to survive without help. Jim then passes out and Obi-Wan then puts him back on the OP and takes him back to his hut. Three days later, Jim wakes up in Obi-Wan's hut. He spots Obi-Wan's lightsaber on the wall nearby, and then Obi-Wan asks him for his name. Obi-Wan calls himself Ben, and the stormtrooper says, I am JM909, and Obi-Wan says, hmm, I'm going to call you Jim. So, yes, I've been calling him Jim this whole time. It was all clever ruse. I didn't even come up with it. Um, But after Obi-Wan calls himself Ben and then calls the stormtrooper Jim, Jim then grabs a lightsaber on the wall, ignites it, and aims it at Ben. Ben says, look, you can take it if you want. The desert is a really difficult place. People need tools to be able to survive. If you think that will help you, then yeah, go ahead, take it. Jim then kind of panics, drops the saber, runs out of the hut, grabs Akani, and then heads back to the Imperial facility. He gets back to the facility. He then speaks to the officer who just full on yells at him, blames him for everything that went wrong in this whole scenario. Obviously, he was the one who said to his officer, probably shouldn't do this. But the officer says that he's going to get all the blame. He's going to tell all his superiors and stuff. And is just yelling at Jim. Jim then goes by himself to, I think, what is his bunk. He takes his helmet off and then sighs and then just says the name Ben. He then puts his helmet back on and that's seemingly the last we see of Jim. And then the final panels of this comic and indeed the series shows that Obi-Wan believes that his time is coming to a close. And it shows the last three panels of his cloak kind of flapping in the wind. And then the final panel is the cloak on the floor of an Imperial facility with Darth Vader's feet on it. And that is where it ends. Obviously, that being the Death Star. So, my friends, that is the end of the Obi-Wan comic miniseries by Christopher Cantwell. It's another anthology series, obviously. Um, I did really enjoy it. It was a lot more enjoyable than I thought it was going to be because, obviously, we know a lot about Obi-Wan. He's an existing character, and I'm always... I don't really like anthologies that much. I just don't find, especially in comic form, that a lot of them really get to delve deep into the, some of the subject matter I want to. But I found that these ones really did hit in ways I didn't actually expect. Lots of cool references and things. And obviously we got even earlier in Obi-Wan's life than we've ever had before when he was a youngling. So all very cool stuff there. 
So what else is going on in general? Well, I've just started reading the Padawan book because you guys will be happy to know I finished Midnight Horizon. So potentially next episode will be my Midnight Horizon book review, which will mean that I've tackled every single piece of High Republic phase one content apart from the mini stories that are inside Star Wars Insider. But the collection for that will be arriving, I think, like November or something. Um, But that basically means aside from those very minor things, I've read every Star Wars comic, book and listened to the audio book all from the High Republic Phase 1. And the High Republic Phase 2 has already begun. I've already got the first issue of the Phase 2 High Republic comics. Path of Deceit should be delivered next week, but I'm going on holiday before then, so I won't get to read it immediately. So I'm trying to read as much as Padawan as possible, and then I can read a lot more of it on holiday, and then I'll probably do a book review, probably for my Patreon for the uh, Padawan book, uh, and then I'll get into Path of Deceit, which I'm very excited to try. Uh, so next week, yeah, I imagine it will be the book review. If I'm, I'm getting back quite late on Wednesday, and I've only got like two days then, and then it's the weekend, so... I may do the book review or I may cop out and use something for my Patreon. Who knows? We'll kind of just see how I feel, how busy me and Megan are and stuff. I know she's got like a personal trainer coming and a few other things and we've got, it's quite busy, surprisingly, the two days that we've got left after the holiday, but we'll figure it out. But the Midnight Horizon book review will be soon. In addition to that, then we've got the Clone Wars Battle Tales stuff that I keep promising, but I imagine what will happen is I'll do the Ghosts of Vader's Castle will probably be the next batch of comics I do. So that'll be released for Halloween, so that'd be a nice bit of fun. Uh, Then from there, I'm going to continue on sort of linking the things between Crimson Reign and Hidden Empire. So as far as I can tell, there are three or four issues of comics from the end of Crimson Reign to the start of Hidden Empire for Star Wars, Bounty Hunters, Darth Vader and Dr. Aphra. So I imagine what I'm going to do is have two episodes and split them. I haven't really figured out fully. I need to kind of sit down, read through the comics and work it out. But the general plan is to do a couple of episodes and they've got a couple of sort of mini arcs in them so that we can get ready for Hidden Empire, uh, which the issue of that I think is delivered to me in the start of November. So Hidden Empire will probably begin on this channel maybe December, but potentially just the first thing in 2023. But once again, we will see about that. So that's generally what's on the future for comics in canon. What else have we got going on? Well, I'm doing the Andor Weekly Discussion Show, where either myself or my good friend Jack from the Pop Gorillas and Seasons Greetings and things, he is doing the hosting duties as well. So doing alternate weeks, he seems to be doing the even number episodes. So, you know, four, six, eight, etc. And then I'm doing the odd ones, you know, five, seven, nine, etc. Uh, so obviously the episode that got released this week was episode seven called The Announcement. So I should be speaking with Spider Dan and Angry Andy about that. Uh, I'm actually recording with them in about three hours from me recording this. So that's for all, all in good fun. Uh, and then I'm hoping to release that really quickly. So by the time you hear this, what should have happened is you've heard the Andor episode that came out yesterday because I'm aiming to record them Thursday nights and release them on Fridays. So normally I don't get much sleep on a Thursday night. But that's obviously what's going on. You can check it out on YouTube as well. On YouTube, there are video versions of several of the Andor discussions, as well as many of my Star Wars conversations, and indeed many of my conversations in Genuine Chit Chat. Just go to youtube.com slash Genuine Chit Chat. Lots of my stuff is in playlists, so you can listen to the various playlists of Star Wars comics in canon, listen to every Vader episode or every tie-in with War of the Bounty Hunters and Crimson Rain and stuff, or you can just listen to every Aphra episode, or if you just want to learn more about specific characters, there's a playlist called Age of and Character Bios. So, lots of places that you can listen to Star Wars comics and canon and lots of ways you can kind of delve into it without just aim- just you know scrolling through the whole of the podcast feed of Comics in Motion because there is a lot of content there. In addition to that, you can follow me on social media at Genuine Chit Chat. I post snippets of my episodes of Genuine Chit Chat and I also post photos of the comics I tackle on this very show. In addition to that, I do post other stuff like movies I'm watching or cool things I occasionally see and on my story I post a few things as well. In addition to that, you can obviously help out the show by rating and reviewing and stuff, obviously as well as sharing on social media, which means a lot. But for comics in motion and indeed this show, if you rate on Apple Podcasts or Good Pods or even Spotify, anywhere like that, really helps the show out and the network in general and obviously if you write reviews and give a good review on styles comics and canon that helps even further so please consider doing that please share with your friends either digitally or in real life you can tell your friends about that Uh, and in addition to that if you want to support the show even more even beyond that and you want to get additional content please consider going to patreon.com slash genuine chit chat for as little as one pound a month which at the moment is about a dollar a month uh, you get access to loads and loads of additional pieces of content so there's an afterthoughts feed so it's basically an rss feed 
episode, you can put it into the podcast player of your choice, or you can just listen on the Patreon app or desktop site, and you get to listen to at least one episode of Afterthoughts every week. And currently we're in spooky season, so me and Megan are watching a lot of horror films. So I'm currently at this rate of releasing an episode every two or three days. Uh, so we had a little bit of a dry spell towards the start of the month because me and Megan both just got ill, so we couldn't really record anything. But I'm making up for that because I've released on there. There's Hocus Pocus, Halloween Kills, Scream 1, 2, and then by the time this comes out, I think maybe Scream 3 will be out. But within the next week, all of the Scream movies should be released on there. Uh, We just have yet to watch Scream 2022, so we'll be able to do that as well. But we have got a few other horror films planned, and we are going to be recording for those as well. In addition to that, and hearing Megan's amazing voice, because everyone loves Megan, uh, there's also my exclusive Star Wars Legends book reviews. So on there, there's Darth Bane book one and two. I've recorded book three now as well, so that'll be up shortly. There's the Shatterpoint Legends novel. There is also the Darth Plagueis Legends novel. So I talk about those, my thoughts on them, spoiler-free reviews, and then right at the end, I give like a plot summary of the whole thing, including spoilers. So if you want to expand your legends knowledge without having to read or listen to audiobooks of hours and hours long, you can listen to my Patreon and you get to hear all about those things. But that is going to be enough from me, my friends. Thank you so much for listening. As always, I appreciate each and every one of you. If this is one of your first times, then please check out some of the other episodes I've done with Obi-Wan Kenobi, as I mentioned in the intro, but you can check in the description. Always check the show notes. I put tons of stuff in there, including all my various guest spots including a recent Disney discussions appearance on Frank Burton's I Like The Sound appearance on Ike's Flame and obviously check out Genuine Chit Chat as well because on there I recently did a big old Star Wars discussion with Ike's Flame so lots and lots of Star Wars but yes my friends this is where I'm going to end it thank you again so much for listening I appreciate each and every one of you I'll talk to you next week with whatever I decide to put out and as always may the force be with you The intro for Star Wars Comics and Canon is arranged by myself, Mike Burton, and the backing music was made by Eric Matias of soundimage.org. You have just experienced host, creator, everything else of genuine chit-chat, and also the host and creator of Star Wars Comics and Canon, found on the Comics in Motion podcast, Mike Burton.